they could have been avoided if the schools had taught the provisions of the Equality Act in different ways and taken the parents' concerns into account. For my part, Mr Speaker, I apologise unreservedly for any offence caused to any person of whatever sexual orientation by anything I have said or written. In particular, I apologise unreservedly to members of the LGBT community in Birmingham and throughout the country for anything I may have said or written which has caused offence to them. Mr Speaker, I can assure you it most certainly was not intended. Thank you. Jack Dramey. Um, Mr Speaker, I had not intended to speak, uh, but in light of what I've heard today, I decided so to do. Can I start by saying this? I come from an Irish Catholic background. Uh, I know from my own experience what cultural conservatism can be like. I know some of the terrible things that happened in the Irish culture, Catholic culture, going back <laughs> over many years. Um, at its most obscene, uh, the Madeline sisters. But ultimately that changed because brave Catholics challenged their own culture and it changed. And now Ireland is a tolerant country with a gay Prime Minister. It would have been thought un unachievable and impossible in decades that have gone by. Now, in relation to what's been happening in Birmingham, um, I'm the first to respect cultures, including cultural conservatism, and that there should be engagement without hesitation. I do not accept that what's been said that there's been no engagement by the head, Sarah Hewitt Clarkson, uh, with parents. Uh, I think there has been engagement, but if I can distinguish between two things, on the one hand, there are those that feel uneasy. But on the other hand, there are, there are those uh, that have been deliberately stirring this up. And it's not just now in Birmingham. Uh, Honourable friend referred to what's happening in Cardiff. But in a number of cities around the country, we're seeing a de network develop, uh, which, to be frank, is absolutely wrong. Because if we go down the path, as a very good Muslim friend and a constituent of mine said, Jack, if we go down the path uh, of dividing and demonising, or in any way suggesting that we would ever do that, then our country and our city is a poorer country. Uh, so I never want to see the day uh, where we ever feed in any way the view that there's something wrong about two men uh, who are living together or two women living together. Uh, I remember in the old Transport and General Workers' Union, many years ago, um, a man who just came out to me, uh, and he, it was desperate. He was in tears. He was, so, he was afraid to speak out. Yeah. But now, in Birmingham, we're the city of pride. Yes. Pride with a small P and pride with a big P. Yeah. We had tens of thousands marching in Birmingham, Very well said. celebrating our diversity. And our diversity, our rich cultural diversity, our rich ethnic diversity, yeah. and our diversity in terms of sexual preference. Yeah. Long may it always be the case. And the final point I'd make, I stress again, I distinguish between a, absolutely that one has to engage, listen, explain. I absolutely I understand that. But, 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 if there are forces on the march, the kind of which we thought were history in our country, then we have to say, no, you're wrong. Yes. yes. Well, I hope it's reassuring to colleagues to know that you'll all get in. Don't worry. <laughs> Angela Eagle. Speaker. Um, teaching about LGBT existence and relationships and showing respect and legitimacy to all, regardless of their sexual orientation, is something that has not been a feature of our school system for very long. That is because of the odious and appalling effects of Section 28, yes. which was passed in the 1980s, uh, in a circumstance which was...
very similar to some of the scare stories that we are hearing about the possible um, dire effects of simply teaching sex and relationship education in schools, yeah. something, uh, Mr Speaker, in my opinion, that we should have been doing yeah. in this country Absolutely. generations ago. And if yeah. we had have done it generations yeah. ago, there would have been an awful lot of much happier and well-adjusted people uh, yeah. than those that have been monstered in the way that they exactly. have for the way that they are uh, in, a, in a system that was disfigured by the effects of Section uh, 28. So here we are uh, many years later, finally making progress on LGBT rights in law and reaching uh, fantastic uh, levels of formal equality in our law, finally. Uh, one of the uh, most uh, important uh, social reforms, I think, that the last Labour government was responsible for, and one which, to their credit, has been continued um, by uh, administrations subsequently. And I know of the Minister's own personal uh, commitment to this agenda. And yet, uh, here we are in the middle of a similar kind of moral scare which is being whipped up by people who have a different agenda to the well-being of children and their well and their ad uh, adjustment to uh, the facts and uh, experience of 21st century life in the UK. And we've seen it uh, as exposed on the television in some of the closed Facebook groups of the individuals that are uh, involved. Are making claims about the sexual orientation of the teachers that are involved in this school, using language that I wouldn't um, use in this chamber. We've seen it in the mob reactions outside. And I don't uh, think that it's appropriate, however we do these things, that young primary school pupils should have to uh, run a gauntlet of screaming demonstrators simply to get to school, um, noisy, vociferous, yeah. aggressive kind of <coughs> shouting and chanting. Um, that's going to be traumatic for any kind of uh, young uh, primary school uh, pupil, and we shouldn't be subjecting them to it. And to be honest, no parents who believe that they're acting in the best interest of their children should be making those children run such a gauntlet. Um, and we know, uh, although I, uh, I, I exempt my honourable friend from this, although I wish he'd have let me ask him a question, um, we know that the uh, motivations of some of those involved in this are reactionary, and they are to return us to an era where LGBT people uh, should get back in the closet and hide yes. and be ashamed of the way they are. We aren't going to get back in the closet or hide or be ashamed of the way we are. And nor are we going to allow a generation of pupils that are now in school to go through what the pupils in the 80s had to go through because this chamber let them down. And nor are we going to allow this to happen in the name of religion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm a humanist. I'm married to a Catholic. And she does much work with LGBT religious organisations uh, to try to put together coalitions across religions of moderate, decent, sensible religious people who recognise the right of LGB people to exist, to have access to respect and dignity, and to have their rights in law. And all uh, we mustn't put together this view that if somebody <coughs> has a religious objection, that somehow there can be no debate about it from then on in. There are multiple views in religions about the legitimacy of LGBT uh, rights, and it's only on the far extremist fundamentalist fringes that we get the kind of hostility that is being shown um, on some of the Facebook groups of these campaigners, and I'd like to know a lot more 
about the network that is behind causing this, because it is a deliberate reactionary attempt to take back progressive advance and decency for children. I am happy to give way. I thank her for giving way. She is uh, speaking incredibly movingly. Um, as somebody who lives uh, closer, I think, uh, than anybody else to the schools, particularly in question, and lives in the community amongst the, uh, the people who uh, go to this school. I, I want it to be said on the record that she is absolutely right in what she says about this being on the fringes, because the Muslim community that I live amongst, I do not recognise yeah, from yeah. that mob. Yeah. 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 Um, um, I thank <coughs> And she has a great deal of experience in this, not least because she lives in amongst the community that is being portrayed in this way. Now, we must, Mr Speaker, not give in to this kind of organised campaign that is effectively being organised from the outside. The Equality Act, which was passed in, 19, uh, in 2010, so has been on the statute book for nine years now, actually says that, people, uh, that, people, that children, uh, schools have a duty not to discriminate against LGBT people, which includes discrimination against pupils who are LGBT, which, and to be fair, wouldn't probably be very apparent at primary school level, but who are perceived to be LGBT, and pupils with LGBT parents, carers and family members. These are the diverse parents that we have in our communities now. And the children that they send to school or the potentially LGBT children in school do not deserve to be treated with anything other than equality and respect. Yeah, 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 yeah. And all of the teaching on uh, uh, relationship and sexual education, all that that means is that this diversity needs to be represented. It's not propagandising, it's not trying to turn people gay, which I've heard about. I'm not sure it's possible <laughs> to turn people gay. Um, but there certainly would be no gay people if, if you had to be taught about being gay. <laughs> <laughs> but their respect, their rights, their rights to have an equal welcome in school, not to be bullied, not to be um, treated as if they're lesser, uh, not to be made to feel that somehow there's something wrong with them, uh, not to feel suicidal, not to be called faggot or lesser in school, not to be humiliated. All of this is what we're talking about when it comes to uh, relationship and sex education. Plain, simple decency. Yeah. <laughs> Stephen Doughty. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And it's uh, an honour and <coughs> privilege to follow my um, right honourable friend for uh, Wallasey, um, a very personal and very um, a passionate speech, of which I wholeheartedly agree. agree. And um, I was sorry that we had to come here today to even have to take part in this debate. And I've, I've listened carefully to what um, the Honourable Gentleman for Birmingham Hall Green has said. Um, I, I listened to his apology. Um, I have to say that um, I'm always welcome to listen to an apology, but um, much of what he said in his speech um, contradicted that and indeed uh, contradicted uh, what he had actually said on that, uh, that recording, which I have viewed. Um, I'm glad he's read the books now, at least some of them. I'm glad that my office has been able to help um, with that. Um, I find it unfortunate that he made comments and waded into this debate without having looked at them, given that they're at the very heart of uh, this issue. Um, I have looked at the books myself, Mr Speaker. I've looked at these materials that so cause so much uh, alleged offence. Um, but there's nothing in them that I think would cause offence. And, and in fact, they, uh, along with many other um, inclusive education, teaching materials and, and books, um, you know, teach about all the range of difference that we have in our lives. And, and they certainly don't get into uh, the details of, of, of sex or anything biologically. You know, we're talking about things that are uh, age appropriate, that are being directed at um, younger children. It's about understanding the world around them, that there may be um, children in their class who indeed are 
are, are Muslim or Jewish or black or white or uh, a woman or a man or gay or uh, lesbian or trans. You know, th this is the world we live in. This is the reality we live in. This is the country we live in. Um, and I live in just as diverse a community as uh, the Honourable Member for, for Hall Green. Um, I, I'm pleased to say that at the weekend I went to um, uh, the Grangetown Festival in my own uh, community um, and was able to visit the Pride Cymru uh, stall right in the heart of one of my largest Muslim communities. Um, and there, mixing in that community, were the LGBT community, different churches, uh, different mosques, uh, different Hindu temples, different community organisations, and they were all just getting on with their lives and making a difference to their community and supporting young people and running activities and running diversionary activities for those who might be caught up in uh, knife crime or other difficulties in the community and, and supporting each other and working together as a community. They weren't interested in dividing each other on the nature of their sexuality or their sex or their race or their religion. Um, they were all working and living together. So there is a different way. Um, there is a different way we can live. And I, and I have watched with horror as I've seen the scenes in, in Birmingham. And as I said, I, I watch with horror because, as I said, I believe that they have been uh, whipped up into a sense of uh, a, a true moral panic about some problem that doesn't actually exist. Um, it's become extremely unpleasant, extremely divisive, as we have seen. And that is spreading, as been said, to other parts of the UK. And, 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 I, and I want to uh, draw the Honourable Gentleman's attention, indeed the attention of the House, to some of those who have been involved um, in instigating uh, some of the uh, language and the, and the protests and some of the uh, division that we've seen. Um, uh, because at least two of them, as I said, have, have come down um, to Cardiff recently, one of whom, um, thankfully, we spotted and a um, uh, talk was cancelled. But um, a, a woman called Dr Godfrey Fawcett, um, who, um, in fact, is being investigated by the British Psychological society at the moment for her comments. Um, she, uh, last year in a YouTube clip, said that there was a totalitarian endeavour to indoctrinate our children in sexual ideologies. Um, she runs the so-called Stop RSE campaign and has talked about a war on morality. Um, another group called um, so-called Islamic RSE, run by a gentleman called Ustad uh, Torofdar, um, uh, I have seen for myself, Mr Speaker, um, the guide, the handy guide that can be handed to parents about how they should effectively infiltrate governors' bodies, uh, PTAs, um, and try and influence activities in their school with a whole set of things that are allegedly going on in their schools. There's no evidence, of course, presented, um, and suggesting that parents might want to get involved and, and raise these concerns. And, of course, it gives form letters to be sent uh, uh, to MPs, um, to the media, to uh, schools, with all sorts of wild and fanciful allegations about, um, you know, uh, trying to somehow corrupt young people. And I'm not going to read out the letter, I've got it, but some parts of it I just find so uh, offensive. Um, as I said, I, I, I've never received a letter of this nature ever in my constituency. I've been an MP for six and a half years, an extremely diverse constituency, an openly gay MP. Um, I have never seen any of these things until the last few months. And they are originating from these groups, and they're collaborating, and they often involve, as has been said by my honourable friends from Birmingham, individuals um, who are not even having children at these schools. So this is the very nature of a, uh, a, a moral panic. It's a very example of one. Um, so I think we need to look at what is really going on here, rather than any actual uh, perceived problem um, or issue. Now, um, my, my honourable friend has, has spoken um, about um, the legacy of Section 28, and um, you know, I, I grew up in a, in, in, a, in a school in South Wales. I certainly wasn't out about my sexuality at the time, and like many other um, uh, LGBT people, um, you know, you struggle with these issues your, your whole life, and it can affect when you come out and how you come out and to whom you come out and all sorts of other things in your life. And I don't want young people um, uh, living today to go through these experiences. Um, uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it's just it's just mm. simply. Horrific. But I know that things can change. I, I went back uh, last year to um, a pride parade in, in the town where I went to school. That would simply been unthinkable uh, 25 years ago when I was at school, when I saw um, lesbian friends of mine being called dirty lezers and everything else and all sorts of homophobic abuse going on. Um, but that relates to a time and a, and a, and a place and a <coughs> set of attitudes and a set of laws which I, I thought we had got well beyond. And um, I'm sorry uh, to see um, chink 
peaks in that occurring in, in different places. And we have to remember this is in a context of a wider set of um, uh, uh, debates and deeply concerning comments that have been being made, I'm sorry to say, including by um, some of the candidates for the uh, Conservative leadership, um, uh, indeed um, by uh, newly elected MEP Anne Widdicombe, um, you know, really, really horrific things which should be, quite frankly, from a bygone age. Um, and we have made such progress in this House um, uh, on so many issues, um, whether in marriage equality, whether in the way we, can, we conduct ourselves in here. And of course, you know, we are the, uh, the, the most, I think, um, uh, LGBT diverse yes. parliament in the world. And, and, you know, that's something we should be celebrating. And I, I hope very much that that is setting an example um, to young people in our country, that you can be who you are um, because God made you uh, too, just like everybody else. Um, now, Mr Speaker, um, we have to think about the other side of this. There's been a lot of concerns um, raised by the Honourable Gentleman uh, for, for Hall Green about the, the, the rights of parents and the rights of um, uh, uh, certain conservative religious communities. But there's no, there's no hierarchy in equality. Um, all those e equality characteristics are there alongside one another for a reason, is that we, we should be promoting all of them, not just one of them, or selectively, or in certain circumstances, or only because it might not offend one group in, in that constituency, in that co constituent group or another. And we have to remember that the heart of this, Mr Speaker, of course, is the well-being and safeguarding um, uh, of young people themselves, including young people in the very schools that the Honourable Gentleman is referring to. And I will happily give Way. In 2001, in Holy Cross Church in the Ardoyne district of North Belfast, there was a concentrated campaign, not just against Father Aidan Troy, the priest of that, but from that community. I recently met two girls, 18 years later, who had been primary school pupils at that time, who are still suffering the trauma of that experience. Even if we can put aside for one moment the substantive argument, would my honourable friend not agree with me that it is simply impossible and unconscionable that we can subject primary school children to this sort of concentrated mob abuse? That cannot be allowed, surely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with what uh, my honourable friend has said. And, um, you know, in, it, it, it just beggars belief that we're, we're, we're potentially creating these situations that are going to affect that, that cohort of children, not just at those schools, but at plenty of others. And, it, and indeed, why that, the reason why there has been such concern about this within the LGBT community more widely is the signals that this sends when they see members of parliament, when they see um, a teacher being subjected to such a, a abuse, when they see um, you know, mobs outside schools, when they see the types of posters that have been displayed. Um, it makes people feel that well, they, perhaps they can't be who they want to be and that they can't go on um, living what they want to be, and particularly for younger people, that is a massive issue. And Stonewall, which of course was, was in this country you know, largely founded around the issue of Section 28, 30 years ago, we'll be celebrating that at Pride this year. I'm very proud that one of the founders of Stonewall uh, lives in my constituency, a very good friend of mine, uh, Lisa Power. I am, uh, uh, you know, I am absolutely um, uh, deeply concerned when you look at the statistics that, that they have um, shared at the moment the, about mental health, about um, the issues um, that young people f face. 84% um, of trans young people have deliberately harmed themselves. Um, in the LGB community, that's um, 61%. Um, two in five LGBT pupils are never taught anything about LGBT issues. Um, half of LGBT pupils in schools say there isn't an adult they can talk to um, about issues um, affecting them. Um, and, and that whole litany of issues of self-harm, of depression, of taking uh, one's own life in the most extreme circumstances is something that should be of the concern of anybody in this country who cares about the well-being and safety of our young people, instead of focusing on uh, you know, some sort of mythological situation which doesn't exist. Um, uh, we should be focusing on the actual issues that affect young people, because there will be LGBT uh, Muslims and LGBT non-Muslims in those schools. There will be. Because they are in our society. And one of the saddest things, Mr Speaker, is any time I speak on these issues, um, I get emails, I get phone calls, I get messages, um, from particularly from gay Muslim men, who tell me about horrific experiences, horrific um, experiences they've had growing up. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't want to see anybody go through that. And that is why it is absolutely right that the government brought forward um, the changes in the law. It's absolutely right that they brought them through in the way that they did. And it's absolutely right that this House overwhelmingly voted for them. Mm -hmm. And we heard a lot of legal references from the um, Honourable Member for Birmingham Hall Green, but a very little mention of the fact that this House, this sovereign parliament, has passed law that there should be LGBT inclusive education in this country. And that is what matters. It is the law. 
People, of course, are entirely free to believe um, and to understand their scriptures, their religions, in any way that they choose in, in their own private lives. I, you know, I might fundamentally disagree with them. I've had many um, <coughs> scriptural arguments with um, uh, fellow Christians who don't agree with me on, on issues around human sexuality. But um, this country sets the law, this country sets the guidance, our state sets the guidance and we had many of these debates around the time I was there with um, my honourable friend um, uh, around the equal marriage debate um, and you will remember Mr Speaker some of the very impassioned debates that took place at that time, you know, as a, as a, as a gay Christian, as, as somebody who um, uh, 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 believes fervently in my own, own religious um, uh, understandings, my own faith, um, uh, you know, that, that is for me to argue with, with God for me to argue with fellow Christians but the law of this land should protect all, and it should protect all equal characteristics equally, yeah. not, not just one over another at certain times and when certain people don't like it or when a moral panic <coughs> is uh, uh, whipped up by those from outside. Um, so, Mr Speaker, um, I, I, I hope that we can move on. I hope that we can see that there uh, are many parts of this country with equally diverse religious communities, um, equally diverse un understandings of, of life and the way we should all live together, but where we all live together in harmony and peace and, and respect for one another, um, and not where children are subjected to um, horrific protests outside of school, and where um, their teachers are subjected to that, and where we seem to be questioning some of the very basic principles that we have established in this House yeah. over so many years. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Stephen Timms. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. I'm pleased to be following my um, honourable friend. I, I rise really just to make uh, one point and put it to the uh, Minister. I, I welcome the fact, by the way, we're having this debate. I share my honourable friend's dismay about the scenes in Birmingham, but I think it's right that we should talk about it and uh, discuss the concerns that have uh, been raised. And my honourable friend from Birmingham Hall Green is right to remind us that religion or belief is among the protected characteristics identified in the Equality Act. But in the debate we had on the regulations on the 20th of March in the uh, House, um, I raised uh, concerns that were being voiced at that stage, particularly by representatives of the Orthodox Jewish community. Um, and I asked whether, after the debate, if we held a meeting of the all-party parliamentary group on faith and society, which I chair, whether the Minister would ensure that officials from his department and from Ofsted came to the meeting in order to discuss with representatives of a, a wide range of faith groups the implementation of the regulations, and I'm very grateful to him that he did uh, arrange for that, uh, and the representatives came and the meeting uh, took place. And there was one idea which emerged at that meeting, which I wanted to put to him uh, today. It's mentioned in a, a letter which I've copied to him, and that is that there should be a requirement that local plans for implementing the regulations in each area ought to be subject to consultation with the local standing advisory committee on religious education, the SACRE, uh, which exists in each area. And I recognise that in some areas there may well be a question about the capacity of those committees to undertake that consultation. In other areas they're certainly well up for doing it. And it is, I think in most areas, a quite a, a, a wide and representative <laughs> body, at the moment focused purely purely on religious education, but the suggestion that emerged was that its remit might be extended to take in uh, local plans for implementing the relationships and sex uh, education statutory instrument um, uh, as well. And I wonder whether the Minister would be able today or, or, or separately just to respond to that specific idea which came out of the meeting which he very helpfully uh, supported uh, after the debate in the House. Martin Doherty Hughes. First of all, can I um, say that I stand in this debate reflecting the fact that I represent a constituency where education is completely devolved, but I wish maybe to enter into a reflective mode for members. Um, I, I, growing up in the west of Scotland in a Catholic stroke Presbyterian Irish Catholic household, um, I am, like many other members, I have I've already heard similar backgrounds. Uh, attending a state denominational school, both in primary and in secondary level, I went to a school in which being heterosexual was the only way you were allowed to be. 
any other opportunity was not permitted. So the very idea that there's any question that people are going to be forced to be gay does not reflect on the reality of those who lived in a situation where we were told we could be nothing but straight. That is a historic reality. And that's not to say that, you know, living on the, the premise of history and reflecting on it, times do change. Uh, unlike many of the honourable members uh, uh, on the main opposition benches, I represent a constituency which is profoundly undiverse. It is profoundly white. It is profoundly Christian. Of half and half between the Roman Catholic faith and, of course, the National Presbyterian Church of Scotland. And we know, and I'm sure many members in this House will know, what religious intolerance can breed. It's called the Reformation. And it reminds us about the role of religion and the separation of religion and the law. But it does not mean that in Scotland, from 1918, we celebrated only last year, 100 years of the Catholic Education Act. And I have to admit, Mr Speaker, I only recently um, have returned to the faith of my ancestors. And I am a person of dubious faith. And I think anyone who says that they are fundamental in their beliefs, no matter how they worship, who they worship, seriously needs to look in and give themselves a good t a talking to. Because without doubt, there could be no question that you cannot fully understand the diversity of humanity around you. And especially for parliamentarians who seek to understand the people they represent. So in terms of the Honourable Member for Birmingham Hall Green, I would say to him, I hope they also reflect on the young gay men and women entering that school today, <coughs> the ones who not only who may vote for them or who may not vote for them, and how they understand this debate. There's also the role of parents. I grew up being brought up by a single parent. Did he make me gay? I don't think so. Did he make me like whisky? I think he did. <laughs> but he made me also question... Ah, well, I'll, I'll leave the honourable gentleman with that one. But he also made me question how you defend the rights of those who are minorities. He always did. Uh, and, and I also reflect on our own personal experience, and this is the only reason I wanted to stand today, was if, as a Scottish constituency MP, I could ask anything to this debate, hearing also from members from Wales who are concerned about uh, the targeting of certain emails. And I have heard from my friend, honourable friend and member of Glasgow Central that they have also now received emails about this debate and how it reflects, it reflects in the Scottish education system. That in Scotland, uh, we have, of course, um, the Scottish Government's LGBTI Inclusive Education Working Group. And it should be noted that the, the Scottish Roman Catholic Bishops' Conference is clear that it could never again see a situation in which a pupil leaves his school in Scotland having prejudice-based bullying, and they fully signed up to the Scottish Government's Inclusive Education Working Group. If there's anything to be gained from this debate today, is to reflect on the lived experience of young gay men and women entering your schools. Now, their parents might not like the fact that they will grow up to be gay. That is a reality. You cannot detract from it, whether they live hiding in a closet or they live openly as young Christian gay people or young Muslim gay people, Hindu or Jew or secular. You cannot enable them to go back into the closet knowing that as elected representatives, we believe that they should not have a place in the education system. They're not enforcing gayness on folk. It is a ridiculous proposition. We live in a majority, heterosexual, normative world. That's the reality. What we're saying to those young men and women is we don't want them to be bullied, to be prejudiced, yeah. to self-harm, to take their lives, to go into lives filled with alcohol and drugs, to kill themselves. That's what we don't want. And if anything, we should offer them today is a listening ear and not a judging one. Yeah. Thank you. Chris Bryant. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. <laughs> I was always taught as a child um, by my parents and at school, all the schools I went to, not to judge somebody according to the colour of their skin and what school they went to, what accent they spoke with, um, whether they were a man or a woman, um, whether they were rich or poor, or for that matter whether they were straight or gay, but simply judge them according to the strength of their character, which would be evinced not by the words that they used, but the things that they did in their life. 
So I approach this debate just presuming that that's what all education should be, about teaching people to judge people according to the strength of their character and what they stand for and what they do with their lives, not some part of their personality which is almost certainly indelible and which wasn't acquired by, I don't know, watching Graham Norton or um, <laughs> passing through the aftershave department <laughs> or whatever um, prejudice people may have about how people come to be gay. I've never wanted a tolerant society. I hate the idea of being tolerated. It feels like people are saying, oh, yes, all right, if you have to, if you really have to, you can live with somebody else and love them. I've always wanted a world that was based and a society that was based on, based on respect. Mm. And my honourable friend is absolutely right to say that um, when all of us in this chamber, I guess we're growing up, that lots of people are a lot younger than me, including you, Mr Speaker, um, uh, when we were growing up, it, it wasn't a world of respect for people's different sexualities. It was a world when, it was a world when people would shout faggot and queer... Yeah. Um, shirt, razor, bender, all these kind of things at you. Mm. And what was particularly difficult about that was that you brought it into yourself. Mm. You sort of believed it. And it took a terrible struggle for many people uh, uh, to be able to tell another single human being. I mean, partly because you might have you might be thinking that this other person might be gay as well and you might think that they might have feelings for you and then you suddenly find, oh, my God, no, you've completely and utterly got it wrong and then you end up being beaten up. Um, or it might be because you are actually terrified of what your parents might think. In fact, when I told my mother, she said she should always have known because I walk oddly. <laughs> You'll all check now later, won't you, whether I walk oddly. Um, she didn't mean it in a mean way at all. It, it, it was just the, the reactions that people had in a different mm. era. And um, what, why I'm so proud, in a way, of being a, a member of the Labour Party, and this is not a criticism of people who are not members of the Labour Party, but there was a man, Edward Carpenter, who, was a, who campaigned for homosexual yeah. freedom, I mean, in a generation yeah. when, it was, when you got sent to prison for it and, and given seven years with hard labour in prison for homosexuality. And on his 80th birthday, every member of the Labour cabinet in the 1920s sent him a birthday card. So I feel proud of being part of a Labour movement which has always, I think, wanted to do right by people who were gay. And there's a little story of a young man in the 1920s again from the Ronda. He was a, um, worked on the railways. Thomas, I don't know his surname. Um, but he was arrested in London Thank you. Um, and he was taken to court um, for um, soliciting, uh, or importuning was the word that was used at the time. This was, um, you didn't have to have, there didn't have to be any proof of anybody having touched anybody. The only proof that he might be homosexual and had committed offence was that he had a powder puff in his pocket. He said that it was his mother's and the police didn't believe him and he was carted off and charged and um, went to the magistrate's court. And again, what I'm proud of, the local MP for the Ronda stood character witness for him. This is in the 1920s. Hmm. So I have enormous pride in the fact that we've tried as a movement to build through the years that sense of respect. And eventually we were able to change the law in many different ways. We brought in civil partnerships. Many young people who were gay throughout the 20th century thought they'd never be able to live with another person, <coughs> let alone be able to enter, publicly acknowledge that they were entering into um, a, a, a union for life. Um, and then the Conservative Party had the opportunity to bring in equal marriage as well. And that's a matter of enormous pride, I think, for this Parliament, for the whole of this Parliament. There are very few people now, really, in this Parliament who oppose any of those measures, or the adoption for gay couples and for individual <coughs> um, gays, the fact that you know, most of us, if we go to a secondary school these days, there will be kids who are openly gay at school, yeah. and it's not a problem. Yeah. Some of them will be camp, some of them will not be camp. Um, it's not a problem. And that's just a source of immense joy. But I have an immense fear too. And this is why this debate really matters. And I, and I, I want to say in um, generosity, I hope, to my honourable friend, that why this hurts 
this debate hurt so many of us is because we'd hoped we'd made a progress that would never be pushed back. And you've only got to look at Berlin in the 1930s, which was the most liberal place in the world for gay men, and then people were sent to the concentration camps and thousands of them died by the end of the 1930s and in the 1940s. So some of us fear that all of this could be rolled back. Mm. And we will fight, not physically, of course, um, we'll do it probably with drag queens and feather boas <laughs> and, I mean, I, and, and, and all the stereotypes you can gather and rugby players and football players one day, please God. And we will fight to make sure that this is not rolled back. <laughs> and part of that fight is, of course, with religion. I say this as somebody who was ordained as a priest. I remember, I hope um, the former Bishop of Oxford, Richard Harry, is now a member of the other place, won't he will forgive me if... He, if I just remind the, him of the fact that two weeks after he ordained me, um, which involves the laying on of hands, he was asked by a newspaper um, whether, what he thought about homosexuality in the church, and he said, well, he'd never laid hands on a homosexual. <laughs> and I just had to say to him, well, you did. <laughs> the very first one you ordained, in actual fact. Um, he's now a magnificent man and came to my civil partnership and I have a deep affection for him because we've had this battle in the Church of England. Um, it's an ongoing battle in the Catholic Church in the moment. And I think that there are many more open minds than there were 15, 20 years ago. I think, um, in fact, the Pope himself has a, has a more liberal mind on these issues and, and, would, and would be furious at the idea that Catholicism and the name of Christ could ever be invoked to um, lead to bullying or to somebody yeah, yeah, not yeah. valuing themselves because of their sexuality. And, and, and just as, incidentally, you can't catch homosexuality, so I don't think you can be cured of it. <laughs> there's, a, a, and, and I know we, we sort of smile and laugh about that, but actually there's a terrible pain that has been brought to so many people, individuals, by that whole gay conversion therapy yeah, theory. Right, yeah. and, and, and I truly hope that that is something that will never be a thing of the future. Now, I know this is a difficult issue for many who are Muslim. Um, as it happens, my constituency is not, is not diverse at all. It's, it's more like the Honourable Member for East Dumbartonshire. West. Um, the West Dumbartonshire. Um, I'm sure there's no segregation between the two. Um, yeah. But I... Uh, 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 and in fact, my constituency, um, despite my having been ordained, is, um, the, uh, according to the last census, the second least religious constituency in the country. Um, but there are people of faith in my constituency, and I often say to them, and I think that they have found a profound generosity, actually, in recent years, for the, in the main. Um, but I think it is still a very difficult issue for many who are Muslim. Um, and there are those who struggle to find new liberal ways of expressing Islam in a modern world. Many Catholic members of this house and of the other place, of course, have often had to, have voted for equality Although, although their church has voted in a different way. And, and so my biggest hope is that Islam will find a way of reconciling the modern era, the things that we know that I would argue our God has taught us to understand in the last 100, 200 years about ourselves and about humanity and about human sexuality, um, so that they will be campaigning outside all those schools to make sure that every child knows that actually sometimes there are two daddies, sometimes there are two mummies, yeah. and sometimes um, uh, it may not be your parents, but it may be somebody else in your families or somebody else in the school. And no, you shouldn't spit at them, and you shouldn't denigrate them, and you shouldn't laugh at them, and you shouldn't call them names, and you shouldn't bully them. Because in the end, and I'll use a religious term again, Equality is a seamless garment. It's, it's Christ's tunic on the cross is a seamless garment. Um, and that's why the soldiers can't tear it apart when he's taken down from the cross. And I think that of equality. And um, the equality that we demand for people, regardless of their religion or their political allegiance or the color of their skin or um, their gender, must also apply in equal measure, in full and equal measure, to the, our sexuality. Yeah. 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 Uh, Richard Burden. Mr Speaker, a real privilege <laughs> to follow so many moving 
and powerful speeches today. I haven't come in here intending to make a speech. I had hoped to ask my honourable friend from All Green a couple of questions, um, but having heard what he said, I was moved to rise to make just a few points. The first is this. My honourable friend has sought to characterise what's been happening outside Anderton Park School as an issue of consultation. I have to say that from what I have seen, the message that comes across from those protests yeah. is not principally about consultation. Yes, it's in there, but it's actually about an objection in principle to LGBT inclusive education. If that's not the case, how else do you read a placard that says it's Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve? What's that if it's not objecting in principle to LGBT inclusive education? But you know, it's not just about the fact that those views are being expressed, it's the aggression with which they've been expressed that has upset and profoundly offended so many people, I believe, of all races and of all religions in Birmingham. The level of abuse that the head teacher has Absolutely. suffered. The kind of thing that has been said through megaphones, not just at Anderton Park, but before that at Parkfield School yeah. as well, is utterly outrageous. And I think we have got a responsibility in this place to stand up and say that is simply not on. Now, my honourable friend has said that if he has upset or offended anyone, he apologises for that. I mean, I'm grateful he said that, and I welcome that. But I do hope he will reflect that when, on camera, he turns to the, one of the leaders of those protests, a man who does not even have a child to that school, and says, you're right, no more, no less, you're right, I do hope he will reflect on whether those words were wisely chosen. Because I do not believe that the message that that gentleman was given is right. Now, dialogue between parents and schools is obviously a good thing. In any part of the curriculum, it's obviously a good thing. But there's also some principles at stake here and some principles that deserve repeating. You see, this, I mean, sometimes the way this is talked about is that if it's about sex education, it's not. It's nothing about sexualization at all. It's about relationships education. And to me, there is one word, and it's come up several times in this debate so far, mm -hmm. that is absolutely central to all relationships education, and that is the importance of respect. Yes. And, you know, I'm sorry I disagree with my honourable friend. I don't think there's any age-appropriate threshold for respect. Mm -hmm. You know, I believe that from the word go, children should be taught to respect other people, whoever they are, whatever they are. And I don't believe we would be right in adopting a curriculum or adopting an approach which somehow implies to young people that if they go to school with a friend who's got two daddies or two mummies instead of one daddy and one mummy, that somehow he or she or, their, or his or her parents are less deserving of any respect than the other child's parents. I just think that is a principle which should be taught from the word go. And it's something we should have no problem in upholding. It's something that I believe is a principle. It's something on which I will not compromise. And it's the reason I'm afraid on this issue I am on the other side of the fence from my honourable friend. Yeah. Uh, Lloyd Russell Moyle. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I grew up in a relatively white, middle class, you could say, suburb of Brighton, a town called Lewis. Um, people of Lewis will hate it that I've called it a suburb of Brighton, but effectively <laughs> it is. And I could have lived my life as a child, never really interacting with people of different faiths, never really interacting and learning about different kind of family units. I grew up in a family of a mum and a dad who were married before I was born and remain married now. But the reason that I understand that there are different family units, that there are people of different religions, is from the very get-go at school, we read books and we were told stories about different families. 
And when the school was going to introduce a book about a child who was maybe Muslim, they didn't call an all-parents meeting to consult and ask, we're going to be introducing a book of, uh, which will introduce a character this semester, this term, that might not quite look like the kind of characters that you see every day in Lewis. No. The school got on with it. And parents accepted it because there was leadership shown, of course, not by, just by schools, but by many people in the community, that that was the right thing to do. So when we're introducing rather mundane books, many of these stories and educational uh, methods are pretty mundane. You know, about a mermaid or about two penguins or, or whatever the particular story is. They're, they're, they're not actually that exciting. Um, to be honest, when we're introducing them, do I expect a head teacher to have to call an all-parent assembly to consult on that particular fiction book that's going to be introduced that is at the right reading level and, of course, is generally appropriate for those children? No, I don't. And actually, I think it's rather dangerous if we kind of expect that, that to be the basis of how teachers have to teach. Every time they want to introduce something new, they're going to teach about biology or they're going to teach an, a, arithmetic this month rather than just equations that they call an all-school assembly. No, I think that that would be ridiculous. And I think that is the approach that we need to be treating this kind of issue. It is about talking about all different kinds of ways the world works through storytelling, through narrative telling and not telling the individuals of what goes in and what goes out, but actually about what love means. And actually that is also important for keeping our children safe. Because if children are not taught about what appropriate relationships are, if they're not taught about what friendships mean compared to what loving relationships mean, what a relationship between adults means differently to relationships between children, if you're not taught some of those basic facts, what you actually do is allow our children to be vulnerable to predators, either at that young age or later on in life. And that... Vul I will give way. He's making a, a really excellent speech and making a really excellent point. And my daughter's just come back from school because the Scottish schools finish up um, pretty soon uh, with a, a whole bundle of things that she has learnt in primary one. And a lot of that is about those kind of relationships and, um, and pretty basic stuff. But would you agree with me that if children aren't all in the same class taught all the same things, they're going to find it out from the other children in the class anyway. She might as well all get the same information and get a, a good, responsible um, <laughs> uh, education from their teachers. Quite, and the danger is, of course, if they learn it second-hand. We all know how Chinese whispers, that game works, don't we? By the time it's the third child down, the message will have been garbled and lost. So if we're going to teach our children about these ideas of respect, about how to keep them safe, we need to do that in the whole way. Now, I was taught by my parents, of course, that, you know, it didn't matter who you fell in love with. I can remember as a child being sung nursery rhymes about falling in love with different groups of people. That's the kind of family that I grew up in. And I feel very um, proud to have had parents that have introduced these concepts. And, you know, my sister is a happily married heterosexual woman. She had these songs talked to her and sung to her when she was young as well. It didn't make me necessarily gay, but it made me comfortable with who I was. But my fear is, and the reality is, let's be honest, parents are loving, but there's no qualification to be a parent. You have some good parents and you have some bad parents. If I had been let to be taught science by my mother, who dropped out of science at GCSE, was, is a linguist and is, a, you know, kind of is, is an English teacher, but knows absolutely nothing about physics or maths, I would have not being able to go on to do my physics A-level or my chemistry A-levels that I did when I was at school. We understand that parents, of course, are the primary lovers of their children, but they aren't always the best to give a holistic, rounded education because they also have not experienced all different elements and all different aspects of the world. And people in responsibility, whether it is teachers or whether it is members of parliament, have a responsibility in these kinds of debates, 
to show leadership. And it was actually the Labour government in 1997 to 2010 that showed leadership. If we had just followed the mob, followed what the opinion polls were saying at the time, it is very likely we wouldn't have made much progress at all on a lot of LGBT rights. We wouldn't have made progress on abolishing Section 28 <coughs> because Brian Souter was busy ploughing money in to garner, um, of course, public opinion in one way. Because we as politicians have to recognise public opinion can be whipped up by dangerous forces and we have a moral responsibility to sometimes make a judgment, not on whether there has been consultation one way or another. This was a totally vacuous argument that had no content to it. But what is the content of the objections? Analyse it and review it. Something I'm afraid the Honourable Member failed to do or articulate in this debate once. Not once did he articulate, actually, the problems with the content of the curriculum. And my friend, what, oh, well, um, my friend, like many members in this debate, is making a very uh, powerful and moving uh, speech. Does he share my concern that actually lots of parents are perfectly satisfied with what is being taught in schools, are perfectly happy uh, that it teaches about respect and about different families, but that if we have the protests of the sort that we've seen, then those parents don't feel able to express that view because they feel intimidated and aren't able uh, to stand up uh, for the things that they'd like their children to be taught about and that children themselves want to be taught about as well. I totally agree, and that is, of course, even more important. That a member of this House, and I would not want to tell anyone how to do their job, but doesn't then go and plonk on one side of that debate without actually analysing until my honourable friend gave the resources to the honourable member, analysing the content of what was being discussed. It is extremely dangerous to not show that leadership and I think that is where this debate was wrong from the very beginning and actually I think the honourable member has been wrong, deeply wrong on how he has handled this issue. Pandering to the mob is never right but it is always easy for an MP to do, and we go in the wrong direction if we do it. Let us remember, of course, one of the instigators of Section 28 was that book, Jenny Lives with Eric and Martin, I think it was. Again, a pretty mundane, pretty boring book, if you read it, you know. Jenny goes and has an ice cream, Jenny goes and gets a book read by one of her fathers. I mean, it's hardly high literature, but a backlash to that in a backdrop of rising right-wing tensions in a country... Button? <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought you said something, Mr Speaker. Of course, caused Section 28 to be introduced. Now, I don't think we are on the verge of Section 28 to being introduced now, but if one is not vigilant in bringing people along on that journey... Now, I'll finish on two points. One is I think there is a place to bring parents along on this journey, not to consult on whether something should be included in the curriculum or not, but to some extent to make up for the fact that we did have Section 28 for so long and many parents failed to receive this level of education and understanding. So I think there is a purpose of reaching out into the community. And before I became an MP, I wrote a education resource for the Council of Europe, which was how you talk to educators and children under the age of 10 about sexuality, different families. Now, the Council of Europe is hardly a, um, ha hardly has members of purely progressive countries, you know, Russia, Turkey, Poland. This is a resource that is accessible in all of those countries now, and I'm very proud of that resource that a team of us helped write. But that was because people in the Council of Europe, British uh, ministers actually as well, helped lead a debate in those levels to change attitudes and to be able to run campaigns to also change minds and educate people. So I do wish that actually we hadn't have really received an apology because what we heard was a defence of the position that the Honourable Member made and then some little apology at the end. I wish he'd just been honest about actually having real problems about 
either the content of this or that he hadn't really decided to take a side one way or another. What we now have is a very disappointing outcome. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. I call the Minister of State at the Department of Education, Mr Nicholas Gibb, to reply to the debate. I'm grateful, Mr Speaker. This has been uh, an extraordinary uh, adjournment uh, debate. Uh, Mr Speaker, worth waiting ten years in the chair uh, to listen to, I would argue, with very powerful speeches uh, by the honourable members for Birmingham, Erdington, uh, Cardiff South and Penarth, uh, West Dunbartonshire and the Rhonda, and a powerful and moving speech by the honourable member for Wallasey, who was right to say that we are not going to allow another generation of children to go through what previous uh, generations endured. And as the honourable member for the Rhonda said, what is wanted is not to be tolerated, but to be respected. Or as the honourable member for Wallasey said, plain, simple decency. And there were well argued and persuasive speeches by the honourable members for uh, Birmingham, Northfield, East Ham, and Brighton, Kemp Town. Now, I listened carefully to the speech of the honourable member for Birmingham, Hall Green, on uh, opening uh, this debate. This government agrees that parents, as the primary educators of their children, should be involved in their child's education in schools. The Government trusts schools to deliver a broad and balanced curriculum that will prepare pupils for life in modern Britain. And we firmly believe that proper dialogue between schools and parents supports mutual understanding and ultimately benefits the progress of pupils. Schools should, in particular, consider whether aspects of their curriculum may be sensitive uh, to the parents of their particular cohorts, and if so, should ensure that they have properly engaged them on this content. But we must also remember that schools have been given the responsibility to educate, and ultimately it is for schools to decide what is taught and how. Equality for all is written into our laws. The Equality Act 2010 provides a legal framework to protect the rights of individuals and advance equality of opportunity for all. It provides Britain with a discrimination law which protects individuals from unfair treatment and promotes a fair and more equal society. Schools are required to comply with the relevant requirements of the Equality Act. Chapter 1 of Part 6 of the Act applies to schools. As an example, Part 6 of the Act makes it unlawful for a school to discriminate against, harass or victimise a pupil or potential pupil in relation to admissions or in how the school is run. The content of the school curriculum is exempt from the duties imposed on schools by Part 6 of the Equality Act. Excluding the content of the curriculum ensures, as the Honourable Member for Birmingham Hall Green pointed out, it, is, it ensures that schools are free to include a full range of issues, ideas and materials in their syllabus and to expose pupils to thoughts and ideas of all kinds however challenging or controversial, without fear of legal challenge based on a protected characteristic. Schools are, however, subject to the public sector equality duty in section 149 of the Act, which means that in discharging their functions they must have due regard to the need to eliminate discrimination, harassment, victimisation and any other conduct that is prohibited by or under the Act and have due regard to the need to advance equality of opportunity and foster good relations between persons who share a relevant protected characteristics and persons who do not share it. Relevant protected characteristics are age, disability, gender reassignment, pregnancy and maternity, race, religion or belief, sex and sexual orientation. We know that many schools choose to teach pupils about the Equality Act and the protected characteristics in the context of duties on schools, such as the requirements to promote both fundamental British values and the spiritual, moral, social and cultural development of their pupils. Schools are perfectly entitled to teach about the Equality Act in this context, and the Department thinks it is right that pupils leave school with a proper understanding of the importance of equality and respecting difference. And to answer the Honourable um, member for Birmingham Paul Green's question on age appropriateness. 
Schools who choose to teach about the Equality Act and protected characteristics should, of course, consider the age appropriateness of all elements of this and plan their curriculum accordingly. That crucial need, Mr Speaker, to respect difference would, of course, be a simple expectation of members of our society were all differences easily compatible. The true test of the concept of respect for difference lies in cases where our differences may appear to bring us in direct conflict with others. The fundamental expectation that we res- is that we respect other people, uh, uh, and therefore at, at times this is hard to achieve and all the more crucial for it. Now, this has been seen in action in recent months as some differences have seemed to divide us. We have seen protests from parents related to the teaching of equality in our schools with a particular focus on teaching lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender content. Now, the media would like to portray this as religion versus LGBT. I don't doubt that there are some people on either side of this debate, without links to the schools involved, who are exploiting the situation due to their own lack of tolerance to the other. But I truly believe that for the majority, there is a real respect for their fellow citizens who are different from them. What is central to this debate are deeply held views on what is right to teach children about LGBT people and relationships at different ages. Not because of... I'll give way to the Honourable Lady. The Honourable Gentleman for giving way. Is he as worried as I am? about the evidence which is emerging of an organised campaign to disrupt the introduction of RSE uh, in schools, which is now spreading from Birmingham mm. to other places. And, and does, uh, will he reassure us that his department will crack down with the utmost determination on those attempts? Yeah. Yeah. Well, as a government, we are a government that uh, introduced the regulations making uh, RSE uh, compulsory in uh, schools. Uh, it was the uh, 2014. It was the amendment to the uh, 2017 Act that uh, introduced that requirement, supported by members uh, on both sides of the House. Uh, today, we are publishing the final version of the guidance that was put out for a consultation. So, we are absolutely determined to press ahead with uh, this, uh, these, this policy. And I think this is a policy that has been very carefully crafted with help from across the House, from individual members of Parliament who have helped us in devising and writing the, uh, the policy, with Ian Balcom, uh, an experienced uh, head teacher from Kent, who helped us draft the, uh, the guidance, and, of course, officials from the Department of Education who worked extremely hard in crafting that regulation, those, reg- those uh, guidance. And we will, of course... Um, press ahead with that policy. I'm stuck for choice, so I think I will start with the Right Honourable Gentleman. The Minister for giving way, and I apologise for not being here for the earlier part of the debate, but I'm pleased that I was able to arrive in time to hear for the, the, uh, the members for Wallace Sea, Cardiff South and Rhonda. It encouraged me to stay to the end of the debate. Uh, but could I ask the Minister specifically as a follow-up question uh, to the point made by, by the member for Wallace Sea, what precisely is the Government able to do in terms of countering what appears to be an organised campaign. For instance, could he provide materials to members of parliament like me who are now getting representations from, in my case, one of the local mosques on this issue? Certainly providing materials together with the guidance that we published today to schools in how to consult and engage with parents uh, on this issue. The Secretary of State made it very clear in education questions on Monday what his view is about... Uh, the importance of teaching about LGBT issues in schools, including in primary schools, and I've written uh, articles and so on. And we will continue to make the case for the importance of RSC. I'm moving slightly leftwards, uh, but the Honourable Member for Rhonda. Well, we're all excited by the Minister moving slightly leftwards. (laughs) Um, I'm grateful to him. Isn't it also worth pointing out that there's an irony here Many parents um, who are particularly concerned about their children growing up might want to know that good sex and relationship education nearly always leads to ta- children taking their first se- having their first delaying their first sexual experience, to making fewer um, uh, risky decisions when they do so, and for making more informed choices. 
which can only surely be in the interest of, of every single child. The right honourable gentleman is absolutely right to make those points. He makes them better than, than I could have. And uh, he will have seen the guidance that was uh, out for draft and which is now in final form. And it, makes, it sets out the important aspects of all those issues that he has cited and what we believe should be taught in our schools. Give way to the honourable member for. Um, I, I do want to press the minister a little bit further on, on the points raised by honourable friends about the sort of organisation of the campaign against the introduction of the guidance. I mean, I mean as I, I mentioned in my speech, I've, I've seen an actual guide provided to parents um, from an organisation called Islamic RSC, which actually advises them to kind of get into governors' bodies, how to handle head teachers, how to do this and that, in quite a kind of a, uh, a cynical way. And then a form letter, which is deeply, deeply misleading, um, attacking the entire government's policy. Um, does he have any plans to issue guidance to schools uh, about this, this sort of orchestrated campaign and indeed to work with the Welsh and Scottish governments, who indeed are going to undoubtedly experience this as well? I have raised it with officials um, in my own city. Well, I'm very happy to work with the Honourable Gentleman, and of course we do work with the devolved administrations on this and other issues relating to, uh, to education. The, the guidance was very carefully uh, crafted and written uh, in order to um, build the widest possible consensus for this policy, which is why it went through uh, this House uh, and the other, this House with an overwhelming majority and the other House without a, without a division. Um, and I would uh, say that those people who are opposed to it are at the other end of the, that consensus. Um, and I'm afraid uh, it's unlikely that we will bring those uh, extreme ends of the debate into that consensus. But I'm very content that we have secured the support of the Catholic Church, the Church of England, uh, and uh, organisations such as Stonewall in support of the guidance that we have created. I give way to the Honourable Member for Brighton, Kent. I, I, I thank the Member for describing these people who have objections at the real fringes. The difficulty is if there is a requirement on head teachers to consult, and that opens the door for these fringe elements to then hijack and to disrupt. How should head teachers respond? Will the Department for Education issue guidance to prevent that happening? And will he ensure that even when consultation happens, it is not consultation with a veto with, by those fringe groups, but consultation to bring people along? But it is happening. It's not a question of if and when and how. It's just so everyone can understand how. That is what we mean by consultation in this case, because I think it's a bit unclear. Well, I will come to this, these points later on in my comments, but consultation is not a vote. Uh, and ultimately, the decision about the content of the curriculum is for the schools. And we are issuing, as I've said, materials with the final version of the guidance today to schools to help them uh, in the process of uh, engaging uh, with parents. But I listened to the comments about uh, campaigning and standing up to the campaigns against RSE, and we will... Uh, consider what uh, honourable members in this debate have, uh, have said. Um, I'll give way to the honourable member. I, I thank the honourable gentleman for giving way, and I wonder if uh, he will be taking any guidance from Nazir Afsal, who is the former Crown Prosecutor in the North West. And uh, I understand that he has been brought in to mediate over this whole situation about the protests outside the schools. He is himself a practising Muslim. He's a very sensible man. He's the chair of the governors at Hotwood Hall College in my constituency. And I wonder if you will be taking any advice from him. Well, I will take the Honourable Lady's uh, advice under advisement. Um, but I, what I would say is that our senior officials... Uh, are working on the ground on a daily basis in, uh, in the, uh, uh, for both schools involved in this uh, dis debate, dispute in Birmingham and with Birmingham City Council in trying to find a solution to this problem. So we are working very hard to try to, uh, to um, assuage concerns, if you like, but ultimately we will be on the side of the head teacher in making uh, these decisions because we do believe that ultimately the content of the curriculum is a matter for schools. Now, what is central, Mr Speaker, to this debate are deeply held views on what it's right to teach children about LGBT people and relationships at different ages, not because of bigotry or intolerance, not to push an agenda, but because they believe they know best for the children involved. This reveals the truth about equality and respect. Sometimes it is hard. And when opinions differ, we should talk, dialogue, is what moves us forward. Now, that is what we are 
That is why, Mr Speaker, we are strengthening requirements on schools to consult parents. From September 2020, all primary schools will be required to teach relationships education, and all secondary schools will be required to teach relationships and sex education, or RSE. We have set out in the regulations for these subjects that schools will be required to consult parents on their relationships or RSE policies. This requirement means that the dialogue we consider so important in reducing misunderstanding and getting this teaching right will be happening in every school. And it is important to note that relationships education is not about sex, as was pointed out by the Honourable Member for the Rhondda. It is about learning the importance of kindness and respect for others and providing children with the foundations to understand difference and be able to build constructive relationships with those who may appear different from them. We are encouraging as many schools as possible to start teaching the new subjects from September 2019, and whether or not schools do so, we recommend they start planning their consultation with parents now to ensure this is done in good time and that it's done effectively. And we'll be publishing, as I've said, we are publishing supporting materials to help schools to get this right. Now, schools are not required to uh, consult parents on any teaching they choose to give about the Equality Act. When this involves young children, however, and when schools know that their pupils' parents have strongly held beliefs related to the content, it is absolutely right that they engage with parents, <coughs> listen to their views and reflect. And to answer the Honourable Member for Birmingham Hall Green's question, I think it would be appropriate for a school to work with parents to determine how and when teaching of the Equality Act is delivered in the school, if that works for them. This does not mean uh, that head teachers should spend excessive time consulting parents or that cons consultation should go on in perpetuity. Schools are well practised at consulting and engaging their parent body on aspects of their activities. Where they have good practices in place, they can and should be used to consult parents on this topic. If schools feel that their current engagement processes are not effective, the introduction of the new subjects is a good opportunity to learn from good practice in other schools and to improve. Yes. Consultation does not mean parents can veto curriculum content. Correct. It means sharing a proposed approach, seeking views and using these to inform a final decision. It is not a vote. Consultation does not mean abandoning teaching about respect for difference. I don't believe this is what parents would want, and it's not what schools should feel they must do. Consultation certainly does not mean schools should be on the receiving end of intimidating behaviour, protests or bullying. The Department has been very clear that protests outside primary schools are unacceptable and should stop. The RSC legislation is clear uh, that it is parents that schools must consult. We do, of course, encourage schools to recognise and reflect on their important foundational role in local communities. And where schools consider it useful to engage members of their wider community on any of their activities, including teaching of relationships and sex education, we would support that activity. But consultation does mean considering whether the strongly held views of their parent body should lead the school to adapt when and how they approach certain topics with their pupils. It is only right for parents to be able to share their views on what and when their child will be taught topics that are sensitive to them. And schools should consider those views. I just finish this one point, if the Honourable Member for East Ham will forgive me. It is only right for parents to be able to share their views on what and when their child will be taught topics that are sensitive them, to them, and schools should consider those views and balance them uh, with their views on the needs of the pupils and wider school community. Ultimately, it is for schools to decide their curriculum, having taken on these views. I give way to the Honourable Member. Minister, for giving way, I just wonder whether he agreed with the point I made that it could be helpful in quite a number of local areas, yeah. I think, to include the local SACRE in the, the discussions that uh, he's describing. Very grateful to uh, the Honourable Member for East Ham for, for raising this issue. Now, I was going to respond to, to his question. We will consider his, uh, um, his suggestion. Um, that's not a promise, but we will certainly consider and take seriously what he has put forward. Now, as the Secretary of State set out, 
uh, in his recent letter to the General Secretary of the National Union of National Association of uh, Head Teachers, schools must have the flexibility to respond to events. For example, a school following consultation with parents on equality teaching or relationship to education <coughs> may decide that for their pupils it is right to introduce teaching about LGBT people and relationships in the later years of primary school. And this will be an entirely reasonable decision. Subsequently, however, I'll give way to just one moment, I just want to finish this point. Subsequently, however, events may mean that this decision has to change. For example, if homophobic, biphobic or transphobic bullying becomes a problem in the school, the head teacher may reasonably decide that some teaching about LGBT at an earlier stage is required to ensure pupils understand that this bullying is not acceptable. Alternatively, a pupil with same-sex parents may join the school in an earlier year group, and in these circumstances it would be right for the pupils' peers to understand about families with same-sex parents to ensure that the pupil feels included. I'll give way to all honourable members in just one moment. Uh, it would be right for, their, for the pupils' peers to understand about families with same-sex parents to ensure that the pupil feels included and their peers understand and respect their family. I believe we can all agree that in those circumstances the school would be right to change their approach and to teach the issue early. I'll give way to the Honourable Lady. Minister, for, for giving way, and I anticipate that many of my honourable colleagues have uh, <laughs> anticipated what I was going to ask, which is, how will you know whether there are children in that school who have an uncle or an aunt yeah. or a friend who's got same-sex parents? Sure. Surely the, it's appropriate that every child from the yeah. earliest stage should yes. know that there are all sorts of different families, some with one parent, yeah. some with two parents, some with two parents who are mum, two, two mums or two dads, because the school isn't going to know what everybody's uh, experiences are, and everyone should know that it's right to respect difference, yep. irrespective of where we come across it. Well, as I said, we consulted very widely on the content of the draft guidance, and we brought in experts to help us draft it, such as Ian Bagg, a very experienced head teacher. We wanted to form the widest possible consensus on landing this policy, and that is what I believe we have achieved very successfully, something that I believe other governments have not achieved in the past. I think it is very important that we try and get that consensus, and that does mean leaving to schools the decision about when these issues should be taught. What is clear from the guidance is that at some point in a child... I will give way to all honourable members in a moment, starting with the member for Birmingham Hall Green. It is important uh, that schools decide when it is appropriate in their community to teach these very sensitive issues, but it is a requirement that at some point during the, their school career those children will learn and will be taught about LGBT issues. This, I believe, is the way to ensure that this policy has the widest possible consensus, albeit we cannot bring into that consensus those at the polar ends of this debate. I give way to the member for Birmingham Hall Green. Can, can I thank the Minister um, for his, his very measured and very clear uh, response to the questions I put to him? Um, I think what he has said today, although it may not be acceptable to other members in this House, will be hugely beneficial and helpful to the teachers in Birmingham who are now reassured in 256 schools that what they've been doing is in fact correct. And I thank him for that. No. I'm, I'm grateful for the Honourable Member's uh, intervention, but I also believe what's being taught in the remaining two schools is also lawful and correct. Uh, I'll give way to. I'll start on the right again. I'll give way to the honourable member for Western Bath. Oh, quite a clarif clarification, oh, Mr. Speaker. I say I'm delighted. Thank God for devolution. But in clarification for some of my colleagues from English constituencies and from my own mind, can he therefore say that those single parents who happen to be homosexual will now need to self-identify to members of staff from schools across the length and breadth of England to make sure that their children get access to equal, inclusive education? No, what I'm saying is that you need to leave these decisions, these very sensitive decisions, to the teachers on the ground, to the head teachers of the school itself, because they are best placed to make decisions that cannot be made at a national level 
and that will apply to all schools in all communities. What we are clear about is that children must be taught about LGBT relationships. They must be taught the relationships curriculum. No, the government has uh, delivered such a policy. It is the right policy. But I believe very strongly that it needs to have the consensus of the religious organisations as well as Stonewall to enable this policy to land effectively in our schools. And I believe that it is landing successfully in our schools. I give way to Norman Ben for the Ronda. Well, I, I mean, I agree with him to this extent that it should, of course, be up to the school and to the teachers to make that decision about what is age appropriate. However, he seemed to be suggesting that it was only once homophobic bullying had arisen in a school that a school would start talking about um, respect for gay people. He seemed to be saying that it was only once um, to a, a gay couple um, appear, who were parents of a child appeared in the school that that should be taught about. I'm sure that's not what he really means, so I, I just hope he can clarify. What I was to do in my comments was to give an example where, after consultation, that a school may well want to change their policy because of events that had happened in the school. Now, it might be that uh, the school had uh, um, ab initio decided to teach about LGBT issues at an earlier stage in a primary school curriculum, and that's perfectly, schools are perfectly entitled to do that, and then they should consult with parents on that, and then that, might then, that will then be the policy of the school going forward, regardless of whether any of those issues arose, and regardless of whether they knew or didn't know about the parental background of pupils in their school. If you wait on the member for Cardiff, the Minister for giving way, and he's been extremely generous in responding, but I, I do have to say I share the concerns. I mean, it, it, you know, if he's being praised by the Honourable Gentleman for Birmingham Hall Green about this, I, I do worry about where, where, things have, where things have headed. And the problem is if we create loopholes or, or opportunities for very, very radical activists, as we've seen in this case, to try and undermine head teachers, to try and intimidate, um, to try and uh, undermine the, uh, the overall government guidance, then they will take those opportunities. Um, and I want to be assured that, that he's going to be providing full back and ensuring that all children, regardless of what their age is, are getting this, not, for example, it being done on the last day of year six or, 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 or some other way of circumventing the law, because I'm sure that's what um, some circumstances uh, they will try and do. Uh, well, the law is very clear. These issues have to be taught. And we will be supporting schools very strongly uh, in delivering this curriculum. What we are saying is that they need to consult parents. But then, having consulted parents, they don't have to... Uh, it's not like, as I said, it's not a, an elected uh, decision about sort of like a vote of, uh, of an act of parliament through this house. Once they've made that consultant, cons gone through that consultation, taken on board the views that have been expressed during the consultation, it is then for the school to decide in their best judgment what they think is the right material to be taught and when, and we will stand by the schools uh, that take that decision. I give way to Honourable Member for Wallace. The uh, Honourable Gentleman for giving way, because um, until we got to that passage in his speech, I thought I understood what the situation was. But what he seems to be saying um, is that he's going to give very radicalised, fundamentalist-type campaigns uh, options to make as much fuss as possible in order to prevent the teaching of LGBT uh, equality and, and relations until <coughs> it's easier to do it. And what he said in his speech a few minutes ago, I fear, and I hope that he'll be able to put me right on this, is, a, is an almost open invitation to these organisations that are already spreading disruption across the country to do even more of it. You cannot compromise with organisations like this. And if the minister doesn't stand up to them now, he will regret it. Yeah. Well, I think the Honourable, uh, Right Honourable Lady is being uh, unjust in how she's interpreting what I've said in my speech. I made it very clear uh, that, uh, that schools should consult parents. Uh, I made it very clear that they are not bound by a vote of those parents, that ultimately the decision on the content of the curriculum and how it's taught and when it's taught is a matter for the school, and we will support the school in that decision once it's been reached. And we've also made it very clear that we do not support uh, protests outside schools. And to use her phrase, to require young children to have to run the gauntlet of screaming and shouting protesters. We absolutely do not support those protests. And we support uh, Birmingham City Council. Uh, we supported them in taking that injunction against those protests. So I think she's being slightly un 
fair in the way she's heard my speech. I give way to the Honourable Member for Brighton and Kempton. I'm, I'm slightly concerned that we are getting caught up in the wrong way about this age appropriateness. Uh, and the Minister referred to the times that this education would be introduced full stop. You could bring it forward or you could delay it. My understanding is that this information, not if this education around being safe, around safeguarding of children, around what appropriate relationships are, should start from the very beginning of school all the way through. The age appropriateness is what age appropriate at each level and how you address it at each level, not about whether it is introduced at each level. And I think that we need to be clear, because there was a danger that he sounded to be siding yeah. like some of the few fanatical bigots that the Honourable Member sided with, rather than actually progressive um, morals that we want to side with in this country. I, I'm sure well, well, relationship education is required to be taught from the very beginning of primary school, but of course it does have to be age appropriate. So it is about friends and sharing and learning about the importance, the, the importance of family. No, there's no intention of delaying the introduction of relationship education. What is a matter for the school is when more sensitive issues are taught, and that really is a matter for the school to decide ultimately. And in doing so, they should be consulting parents, but that doesn't mean to say that parents have a veto on the decisions taken by the school. Now, the Secretary of State and I are clear. I'll give way for the final time. They really want to. Could you just clarify for me, what is sensitive? Yeah. I mean, in terms of this context, what do we mean by sensitive? Do we mean um, talking about families that are single parents, etc.? Or are we talking about trans issues? Or what, what is sensitive? Because yeah. I'm a bit confused and I'm a bit worried that that word will be used as a hook to put things that we might not want to put on. Well, that again is a matter of judgment for the school. They will know their communities, and that's why we are saying, and it's a requirement, that on these issues that the school should be consulting parents. In fact, all the best schools in the country consult their parents on a wide range of issues, and they may even consult them on issues such as arithmetic. They, it's very important to have a, a parents' parental engagement with a school. And I, think, uh, and I know schools that do uh, talk to parents about how reading is taught in their schools. If they're introducing a new phonics scheme, they will want to talk to parents about those kind of issues. So I think parental engagement is important on, uh, on this particular curriculum. Now, the Secretary of State and I are clear that we support any school having engaged with parents and listened to their views that takes a reasonable decision to teach their pupils about LGBT people and relationships and the guidance on relationships education and RSC makes clear that pupils should receive LGBT inclusive relationships and sex education during their school years. And the department strongly encourages primary schools to teach about families with same-sex parents. Now, in most cases, this will be possible and an important part of the education about respect for difference that's right for all pupils. And I hope that in all cases, parents will have discussed these topics with their child's school and understood their approach. And I hope that they will have satisfied themselves that the school is teaching the right things at the right age to complement what they teach their child on the importance of respecting other people. Now, I'm grateful to the Honourable Member for Birmingham Hall Green for his views on this important topic today. Parents are the primary educators of their children, and on matters such as equality, respect and relationships, schools complement what the child is taught at home. It is therefore crucial that schools and parents engage in constructive dialogue to understand each other's views. Only through open communication can trust be built and maintained and proper respect shown for difference. Order. The question is that this House do now adjourn. Does one of that opinion say aye? Of the contrary, no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Order. Order.
The proceeding has ended. 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 The proceeding has ended.